So chapter four is about the uh, transport layer. The transport layer has two protocols, well, two popular protocols. That's TCP and UDP. So one of the questions that you guys might see, whether it's this week or next week, is how does a client assign a destination port number? Well, first of all, what is a port number or a port address? What's going on at the transport layer? This is the first time we're actually dealing with encapsulation, right? The application layer was responsible for acting as an interface between us and the network. And applications came in two flavors. The apps or the software that ran on the client, and then the other piece that ran on the server. What was that other piece called? Anybody? Service. Service or daemon. Yep. And they're sort of like reciprocals to each other. One you use, the other the server has running all the time, and it's responding to requests. Correct? Each service that we use is going to have a default port address. Example is HTTP. The default port, now it doesn't mean it can't be changed, it just is a very common port. It makes it easier for us first attempting to going out there and fetching the resource. For HTTP is port 80. Another service that we talked about last week was SMTP. What was that service used for? Sending email. Yep. And that port, and you need to know these ports, it's going to be port 25. What about the one that allowed us to download email? 110 is going to be this, but this protocol was called what? Or this service was called? The post office protocol. POP for short, and allows us to download emails. Typically, we download them from an MDA, right? Mail delivery agent. Get to know these acronyms. I didn't discuss this protocol or this service. It's being so commonplace today that we replace it using a web browser and we provide it more with a GUI interface. Anytime we try to upload a file to a server, we're using the file transfer protocol. And that comes in two ports, ports 20 and port 21, whereas one is used for the data, transferring the data, and the other one's for control information. Another service we talked about last week was DHCP. When do we use DHCP? What does that service allow us to do? Yeah, automatically assign computers an IP address. In fact, it's short for dynamic host configuration protocol. And I have to remember what port this is. Gosh, it's, uh, I want to say 67 and 68. 67, I believe, is the one that you send it out, meaning, hey, I need an IP address. You're going to make a request. And 68 is the one where you listen in on. What about this service? I believe we spent some time talking about this one last week. DNS, where is that service used? How about Eric up front? First Eric. When do we use DNS? I call it the phone book of the internet. What do I mean by that? Yeah, we resolve domain names into IP addresses. And DNS is going to use port 53. Another service we haven't really explored into yet is called Telnet. And that's going to be using port 23. Whoops. And I believe one of your exams questions that you guys had this weekend, your assessment, was what's the difference between Telnet and SSH? SSH stands for Secure Shell. And it's no different than Telnet other than all the communications that come and go out of an SSH, sorry, SSH session is going to be encrypted, hence the secure part of Secure Shell. And SSH uses 22 as its default port. Now, if I'm a client and I open up a web browser, my destination port, by default, is going to be port 80. Hence this option down here where the majority of you got right would be correct. This range of addresses fall between 0 and 1023. 
and that range gets a special name. They're called well-known ports. Fortunately, you guys don't have to remember all 1,024 of them. But you will have to memorize the ones I wrote on the board. Why? Why does that become important? Why should we commit those to memory? Well, when we start looking at the basic common applications that are being used across our network, we can see HTTP as being the very first one. And as we start pushing security onto our network and we add devices like firewalls where they actually inspect these ports and block the ones that aren't being used, we can start to understand why one service is working, why one service is not working. The other thing that becomes handy is when you're looking at the data itself and you're analyzing the packets using Wireshark, an application that we'll save until probably middle of October, is that all you're seeing is zeros and ones flowing across your network. But eventually those zeros and ones are going to be grouped together to represent different pieces of a header. And those pieces are called fields. And in a segment for a transport layer, one particular field is going to be the, called the source part, the source port. Another one, so we're looking at a TCP segment field or fields. TC segment header is about 20 bytes. One field is going to be the source. The other one's going to be the destination. There's 16 bits a piece, or two bytes. When I'm listening in on a wire, and I'm seeing some electricity change up and down, some voltage change, then. I know by counting 16 changing states that that 16 changing states is going to represent possibly a source port or a destination port. If I can convert those back into some decimal number, I can look them up to see exactly what the message pertains to. Once I know what the message pertains to, because remember, above the transport layer is the application stuff, correct? the data. The application is completely oblivious what happens underneath it. How the transport layer functions is entirely up to the protocol the transport layer uses. And if an application would see this, even if a programmer would see that, they would be really disgruntled with what the transport layer does with the application data. And that's simply, it rips it all up into pieces. If this was your paycheck, you wouldn't be happy about that. Why does the transport layer break the data into tinier segments? This gets harder and harder. Why do we have tinier segments and not the whole data? This is something we talked about in chapter two. It's easier to send small segments than it is to send one big one. Exactly. And if one piece gun's missing, I don't have to resend the whole thing. All I have to do is send the missing piece. Now, like I said, if Internet Explorer saw that, or even Firefox would see what you did to the data, it would flip its shit. But it never knows what's going on there, because the transport layer, by the time it gets everything back together, it passes up the application. The application sees it as the whole entire file. In order to be able to put it all back together, it's going to need some kind of tracking information, which we call sequence numbers. Now, I believe sequence numbers are 32 bits, but I'll have to check it. It's either 16 or 32. Uh, it'll happen. I'll, I'll verify that for you guys. I want to say 32. Next field in this header is going to have something called an acknowledgement number. And that's going to be the same size as sequence. But like I said, let me check that on for you guys. I really do believe it's 32 bits, but. I could be wrong. It wouldn't be the first time either. 
Each field, and there's other fields that we're going to get into as we progress through this uh, class, has a certain purpose. The destination is identifying the application, I should say the service on the server, that should be receiving the data. I can use that to determine what the message should be so I can decipher it and make sense out of it. What about the source? In fact, I believe that's the next question, the next poll. How does a client assign a source port? You know, I really don't care about how it's being signed as much as why it's being signed. What is the purpose of this field? Like I said, the application layer is completely oblivious to what goes on at the transport layer. And you know, the other thing that happens, the same thing is true, is the lower end layers are completely oblivious of what's going on in the application layer. They don't know how many apps are being ran, how many applications are running, are using the network connection. All they're seeing is some zeros and ones that are flowing in a constant stream. They don't know where the stream begins and where they end for each message. It's a never-ending stream of zeros and ones. The transport layer uses the source field, the source port, to identify each application on the client's machine that's making the request, that should be receiving the data back from the server. But we're going to skip over a realm. We're going to drop down to 49,150 because I got to go to the next one. And that's going to go all the way up to 65,535. And you know what? There's my answer, folks. I was wrong. It's 16 bits, and that's my final answer. And the way I can tell you, I need everybody to do this just to verify the work. This range is called the dynamic range. I need you guys to open up your Windows calculator, switch your mode to either programmers or scientific, and take 2 raised to 16. If you take 2 raised to 16, you should get 65,536 if you do this correctly. I like to have you guys do that work because you need to understand what bytes represent. Bytes are sort of like different possibilities that could be represented by the sequence of zeros and ones. For instance, if I have 16 bits, that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. How many different responsibility, uh, sorry, different possibilities can I represent? I can say all zeros represent one application. I can say all zeros and a one represents another application. Remember, I only have two choices when it comes to binary. I can say all zeros and a one followed by a zero can represent another application. Is that what we get though? When you guys take two raised to 16, are you getting 65,536? That's how many different applications I can represent using a 16-bit field, okay? And if you're wondering where long do we go with this, well, the well-known set from 0 to 1024, those are the old classic applications, and obviously there's going to be another area, another private area, that goes from 1024 to 49,151. This becomes the registered area. Every segment that leaves my computer gets stamped with a header. And in that header, there's going to be a field. Those fields are going to be source, destination, sequence, acknowledgement, and a few others. The important thing that we realize is that by, this, by the standard, we set aside 16 bits. So we limit it. Why 16 bits? Well, we had to find that balance. 8 was too little. 32 was too much. And what do I mean by too much? The bigger the header becomes, the longer it takes the data to arrive, right? It's overhead. The more employees you guys have for a company, the smaller your profits get, correct? 
There's a certain balance. There's an optimal area. Not enough employees also means smaller profits. So you're trying to play that balancing game. How many employees do you need so that you reach the optimal level of production? Correct? Likewise, how many bits should we be using to represent controlled data encapsulation? And so we said, well, let's try 16 to see if that works. We are moving to another version of TCP that handles more port addresses. At the time it was developed, we thought 16 was going to be way too much. And what we did is we broke them down into three groups, traditional, classic applications, then registered ones. And that's a pretty large chunk. From about 1,000 to about 50,000, we're saying to any company or private programmers, if you want to develop software, you need to reserve, buy a port address that rep represents that particular software. We call this a proprietary protocol, a proprietary port address. And it's quite popular. Xbox Live has one. And what company would I buy or register this number with? The Internet Authority of Assigning Numbers and Addresses. So it's A, sorry, I A N A. It's one company. There's also ICANN, and there's a few others, like the Internet Engineering Task Force. But the idea is that no two applications of the same type will have a different port address. All web browsers use port 80s. If I'm writing some special service or some special application that's not doing what another existing application has done, like FTP, an example of this would be like voice over IP, then I'm going to reserve a port address. So that anybody that writes software that can listen into this port understands what the data is going to be about that's flowing through here. Does this make sense? So when it comes to this part right here, what about the client assigning the source? Well, we understand that the client could have multiple applications running at the same time, having data come and go. And we're going to assign those numbers dynamically because they change all the time. So I'm looking for this one right here. It's randomly assigned from a dynamic pool. And they don't own it. They're leased. In fact, if you close out of your Internet Explorer and you open it up tomorrow and you create another web session, it's going to be some randomly number assigned that the operating system can use to identify what program was used to make the request. This is that whole connecting the layers together. So no matter what you do with the data, as long as you put it back together and send it to the right application, sorry, the right program that's requesting it, it should go without a hitch. The client assigns the source port address dynamically between this range and that range. Can they come down here to 1024? Yeah, absolutely. But this is becoming more and more regulated by ICANN and IANA that we're strongly pushing the 49,152 up to 65,535. Is that a recent change? Uh, yeah, last five years or so, maybe even before then. And the reason why it's happened is because there's been a big boom in mobile app development and a big boom in networking program. In fact, most companies are now looking for network programmers than they are just regular software programmers. Because we're finding out what makes money is services. Just look at Netflix. That is a service that's offered through the web. And that has its own port. And if you want to write any, network compl sorry, any Netflix compliant device, you have to understand that protocol, that port. All right. What happens when this message gets to the destination? The server will flip the destination and the source port around. So when they send it back and the operating system gets that message, they can identify what application is using it. After all, who's the source now when the destination received the, pass the message and they want to respond to it? The server's the source, correct? 
and it has to go back to the client. So remember, this is that sender receiver and how they switch roles in the same communication process. Likewise, these flip. So what about sequence numbers? You heard me mention earlier that they're used to put the data back together, but they're also used for uh, tracking it. Well, hmm. I guess you guys can answer this question now, right? 80 is for what? All right. This is definitely telling me you guys aren't doing the reading. You really need to do the reading, and it's probably a good idea to do it before class. There's a huge table in there that talks about these well-known ports. And trust me, if, once you get familiar with Cisco's questions, if you see a table with things like this on it, you can bet your life that it's going to be on there. What would be the correct answer? Majority's never, uh, sorry, the majority sometimes isn't right all the time, right, guys? How does TCP manage flow control? When I was talking about source ports, did I mention anything about flow control? And what is flow control? Remember, data is coming down from the application layer, and the transport layer is going to be segmenting it. I never told you how big those segments are going to be. The more segments you create, the more overhead is generated. Because every time you create a segment, you're going to have to deal with these fields plus some others I haven't mentioned yet, per each segment. So the idea is that balancing act, and that is to try to minimize the number of segments required to help offset the wasteful bits to try to increase efficiency. Flow control is basically determined how overwhelmed the end device is becoming, the other end device, right? You're sending it to somebody. How overwhelmed they're becoming, like a server being inundated by everybody at one time. And they decide, well, let me back this off because this person can't keep track of large chunks of data. Let me drop it down to smaller pieces. Many of them, but manageable sizes, right? Source port's not about that. In fact, destination's not about that either. All that is is to identify the service or the application, period. What about sequence numbers? Sequence numbers are used to put things back together, and it's used for tracking missing pieces. If the question was, what does, H, sorry, what does TCP use to manage reliability, then sequence numbers would be part of that answer, which leads us to a window size. I know it's sort of misnamed, if you will, because we're not talking about Microsoft Windows in this regard. What we're talking about is a window of opportunity. A certain size that can be transmitted, that the other end can receive and acknowledge it before we retransmit again. So consider it as a window of opportunity. And TCP loves adjusting the window size. In fact, if you guys aren't happy with the default window size, you can go into your Windows register and change this window size. And on Wednesday's, sorry, Wednesday's lecture, we're going to be talking about the three-way handshake and how TCP ensures a reliable communication process. If you read Chapter 4, that's all you were hearing throughout Chapter 4, was reliable communication and how it would vary depending on UDP. So let's go through this, finish up the last couple of slides. The stepsister, if you will, the other end of the TCP protocol, sorry, uh, transport layer, is going to be UDP. You can think of TCP and UDP as being opposites. And that is TCP ensures reliable same order delivery. It's connection oriented, whereas UDP is not. UDP is not dependable. UDP does not put things in order for you. If you get something out of order, it is processed and pushed on. You can think of UDP as streaming a video from YouTube. Sometimes frames are dropped. If you've ever watched your TV, if, you're, if you have internet TV or digital TV services, when you're watching, you ever notice like some frames drop and you're like, what, what just happened? Maybe it gets all goggled up. That's because it uses UDP. UDP is very time sensitive. In fact, that's the biggest thing that UDP counts on. 
It's all about timing because it's dealt with time sensitive materials like video stuff, like phone conversations. If we were to use TCP when it comes to video or telephone conversations, the new issue we would have is there would be a latency, a lag. Yes, the message got there. There would be no question whether you got it or not. It's just that when you say hello to somebody, it'll take forever for that hello to get there and they're concerned like, are you still at the other end? Because of this lag in between them. We say to ourselves, if they don't get it and they're using UDP, just like in this class, if I was to teach this using TCP, what I would have to do is establish 18 separate connections, one for me and one for each of you. And every time I sent something to you, I would ask for an acknowledgement. I would say, Bob, what did I just got done saying? And Bob would say, Nick, you just said, what did you just got done saying? And I'd be like, good job, Bob, and now we can move on. But I have to do that 18 times. We would hardly get anywhere in this class if that's the way we handled it, right? But what would I have accomplished if I used a dependable connection like TCP? I know that everybody in this classroom understands this material because I'm getting an acknowledgement from you. And if you don't answer the question, I'm going to make sure you get it. Whereas UDP, I say it, it is your job if you don't get it or if you don't understand it to do what? Stop me. Raise your hand, ask the question. Correct? Why do I prefer this met method when it comes to teaching versus the other one? Time. I only have 50 minutes in a class period, or 55 minutes in a class period, to go over this stuff, and there's a lot of stuff to go over. I asked you guys to read ahead so you can build the foundation so when you do come to class, some of the stuff isn't foreign. The save on time. When you are reading the stuff on your own, there is no connection between you and the book. If you miss something, you're not understanding it, you can't ask the book to, hey, slow down, readjust this, tell me in like if I was a five-year-old. You have me as that opportunity to do that, and I can switch my modes between a TCP, a connected oriented service, to a non-connected in real time service like UDP. In fact, some of these services over here are strictly one or the other. Both UDP and TCP use, now I think POP is actually UDP, port addresses. FTP is going to be TCP, DHCP is going to be UDP, DNS is going to be UDP, Telnet TCP, and SSH TCP. This tells me whether the data is sensitive, and what I mean by sensitive data is, hey, does it need to be in the same order as it was sent? Do I need to ensure that everything was received without any errors. Example would be if I downloaded a file and I tried to install this file that I downloaded. If I'm missing one piece, could the installation process be conducted? No. So this is why FTP is going to be using TCP. However, TFTP uses port 69 as a UDP service. The T for TFTP is trivial. The kinds of files that are used to transmit TF to be using TFTP are large files. Now, UDP isn't dependable. If something happens in the process of transmitting a larger file using TFTP and things didn't go correctly or smoothly, I will have to as the end user, verify the results, and if they are not correct, retransmit the file. Why would I choose UDP to transmit a larger file versus TCP? 
Why is it faster? Because a UDP header is only 8 bytes. Whereas a TCP header is a minimum of 20 bytes. The payload, that's referencing the stuff that I actually care about. A UDP header can fit more of the payload, more of the data, hence less, by the way, a UDP uh, and PDU is called a datagram. So less overhead, more payload, the opposite is true for TCP. More tracking information to guarantee reliable same order delivery, however, less payload. Now, folks, we're not doing just one segment. We could be doing millions of segments per each file that we transmit. So that 20 could be amplified up to a million times, which means that's 20 megabytes. And in a larger file, like a movie that's like 10 gigabytes, typically you're only getting 60% of the payload. Let's just round it down to 50%. If you use TCP, TCP would take you twice as long to download that movie versus UDP. Now, I'm not going to get you guys in trouble. I'm not going to ask you guys to raise your hand how many people have downloaded movies or TV shows. But what I could say is how many people have downloaded large files and you use a special application like a BitTorrent or BearShare or something to the likes. You notice when those applications are running that the large single file that you're trying to get is broken up into tiny pieces. And then if that one of those pieces fail, the application will actually go out and make that request for it. UDP by nature is unreliable. This is not to say that you can't use it for sensitive stuff. Obviously, if you're downloading a movie and you paid for it, you want to make sure it's downloaded in its entirety, correct? It just means that UDP is going to say, if data is sensitive for this purpose that you're going to be using this for, then the upper layers have to manage this. And that's why those torrent sites or those torrent applications will try to package this all together and as they're trying to unravel or uncompress the file that you're downloading, it'll stop somewhere in the middle saying corrupted file, re-download this. Have you guys experienced what I'm talking about? The application is telling you that you have to do this. It's no different if you're having a conversation with somebody and it cuts off. Something's dropped because the network con uh, congestion is too high. And what do you say if you can't hear the person, if they get cut off? Sorry, I couldn't hear you. Can you say that again? You reestablish that session. You reestablish the data to get it retransmitted. What happens when YouTube is dropping or getting uh, choppy on you? What do you do? You reload it, you pause it, and you let it buffer up. Correct? You're doing that. TCP doesn't do that. Do you see the types of services that are using TCP? Because they're saying to themselves, how do you know whether a web page load up in its entirety? How do you know if that email that you're supposed to receive is fully intact? Those applications are designed to depend on the lower levels to guarantee reliable communications. So when we get to this, time, large data, low overhead. Which is a TCP function used to provide reliability? So this is the counterpart to it. There is no such thing as a UDP segment. We'd call this a UDP datagram. Source port, destination port, I think I beat that to death. Acknowledgements. I got to the sequence, and now I need to talk about acknowledgement numbers. If sequence numbers are used to put the segments back in order to form the data, then acknowledgement numbers are used to inform the other device what we have received and what we expect to receive next. So if, for example, this segment is number two, 
then maybe I will expect number three to come next, correct? So it's like I have received this because I can read it. It's on my end device. I'm going to send back something to the other person acknowledging what I received and telling them what I expect to get next. If I receive segment two, I expect segment three. What if I didn't receive segment two and I've been waiting and waiting and waiting? I timed out, gave up. What would I send back to the other end device? If I haven't received section, sorry, segment two. If it's supposed to be reliable and dependable, that's what TCP is all about. I cannot move forward unless I have one, two, three, four, and five, correct? If I receive one and I haven't received two in a timely manner, I will send back a message to the receiver saying, I need you to send me two now. I haven't received it yet. Another time could be is I received one and three, but I haven't received two. As a confirmation to three, I would send back I need two again. This is for Wednesday's class. We're going to be talking about the reliable communication using TCP. But nevertheless, acknowledgments is one way. It's not the only way. There's another two parts to it. The window size and sequence numbers are part of actually handling reliable communication with TCP. Now we're at, to, I believe this is the last one for our uh, poll. What application layer protocol makes use of TCP? Why doesn't DNS use TCP? I mean, isn't it, after all, an important service? If I can't access a website because I'm waiting for a service to resolve my domain name into an IP address, wouldn't you expect DNS to be using TCP? It's reliable. It's dependable. What's that, Derek? Exactly. And this is why UDP is also called a transaction-based service. That is. My purpose is to go out and get a web page, but in order to access the web page, my, server, my client entered a domain name. I need to get that quickly resolved so that my web browser doesn't time out and can go on to doing its job. A particular transaction. It's good for that particular time, and then I lose connections. I'm not looking for a long-term relationship with my DNS server. I'm looking for a long-term relationship with my web server because I could be updating my Facebook status or uploading pictures and I could be going back and forth with this. But all I needed was Facebook's IP address for that beginning of the session. And now that I know it, it's stored what? Locally in my cache, I shouldn't have to ask that question over and over again. What about DHCP? Isn't that really important to have? When our computers first boot up, Remember the four-way handshake when it comes to DHCP? Hey, is there anybody out there that hands out IP addresses? Yes, I hand out an IP address. Here's my offer. The client says, I would like that. They make the request. The server says, it's yours or it's not yours, correct? Remember, during this process, there isn't any unicast. There isn't any IP addresses, so you can't have a private conversation with the server. Everybody's hearing it. Watch the packet tracer demo that I posted online. And anybody can grab it. Anybody can accept it, correct? Guess what? It's not dependable. So it uses UDP because it's fast and it's efficient. If we had TCP, we'd have to establish the session. How do you establish a session with a non-IP address machine? So Wednesday, we'll talk about sessions. You guys take care. Read uh, Chapter 4. Tomorrow, we'll be going over the lab study guide and how to submit that.